This is the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. Here's Robert Kiyosaki. Hello, hello, hello. This is Robert Kiyosaki of the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. And as some of you already know, we broadcast from gorgeous downtown Old Town, Scottsdale, Arizona, where it's either heaven or hell. And surprisingly, it's still heaven. It should be hell a couple, couple hours maybe. But it's one of the most beautiful places on earth to live, except in the summertime. And I'm joined here with my sweetheart, Kim, and we have a very important show for you today. And this is the question. You know, we played Money, 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 which comes from our president's famous show, The Apprentice. Now, I know some of you love him and some of you hate him. Well, that's not the issue of this show. The show is about real estate, in my opinion, and according to my tax advisors and anybody who's in the know about real investing, there's nothing better than investing in real estate from debt and tax points of view. It is the best. And naturally because President Trump is a real estate guy, the brakes got even bigger for real estate investors. <laughs> I love it. But anyway, today the question is for all those interested in investing in real estate and making more money, what is the number one investment in real estate? You know, real estate, people say, well, I'm, in, I'm investing in real estate. I go, well, what kind of real estate? You know, some people flip houses. Some people, I don't know what they do. They fix them up and then they re-rent them or, or whatever. There's millions and millions of ways. There's warehousing, many warehousing. There's golf courses. There's hotels, apartment houses. So the question is, what is the number one most important, most profitable the, the, the investment to be, real estate investment to be in today. And that's our discussion. So Kim, what would that real estate, in, what category of in real estate would that be? Well, you know, it's interesting because people always ask when it comes to real estate, oh, where should I invest? What city, where's the best place to invest? And that of course all depends on what you're talking about, Robert, what are you investing in? Um, but one of the biggest questions is what's the trend? Where, what is gonna be hot today and down the road? And that's what you're asking. Yep. And this is gonna be a fun show because what we're seeing and what our expert is gonna be talking about is a product called Assist. Wait, wait, that's not good <laughs> oh, What's the I'm worst? I'm not gonna say it. <laughs> First of all, let's start with the worst. Okay, there's, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven categories. Of the seven categories, what's the worst? And it's vacation homes. Well, that makes sense. And you know, and what most losers do is they buy themselves a big home, and then the next thing they buy is a vacation home. Now, did we do that, Kim? We did. Yes, we are the biggest losers. We, know. we, we, have, we have three vacation homes, like yes. idiots. And one we sort of, and one we kind of rent out occasionally, but it's not certainly not an asset. It is a liability. Yeah. So that's why you know, ladies and gentlemen, so what should I invest in? You know, I said, well, how about education? And so this radio program, you're going to get the number one, so let me give you the, the, the next worst, single family homes. High income. High income. You know, for rich people and all that, they wanna buy them and flip them and do whatever they do. But you think about that, and let's say, you know, the, the market's doing well, the economy's doing well, and so you have this expensive home that you're renting out, and all of a sudden the economy turns, and the first thing usually that people do is they go to something cheaper. Oh, so those high-end homes start yeah, they, sitting on. Or they buy a a, a high-end home, they want to flip it. And then <laughs> the economy course. reverses on them. And, like the, And they get flipped. <laughs> they get flipped over. <laughs> Good. I have another F word for that one. But anyway, <laughs> the next one are multifamily condos. Oh, Kim and I have had condos. They're almost worse than vacation homes. And the one reason is homeowners associations, HOAs. Homeowners associations. And, and you know, they often say too, the last thing to become successful before the market turns are condominiums. Yep. So if all of a sudden condominiums are becoming very popular, you may wanna look and see something may be changing in the near future. Yep, yep, yep. I, I love the HOA, HOA, <laughs> Homeowners Association. I have other definitions of that name. Kim has seen me go to war against those guys, and I tell you, you cannot talk to homeowners associations. They could be the worst people on planet Earth. You know, but, they're horrible people. Which is a really good point, because if you're investing in real estate, is there a homeowners association you have to deal with? Because a yeah. lot of homeowners associations do not like renters. They no. want they want owner-occupied. Oh, worse than that, our HOA, when Kim and I were first starting out years and years ago, 
we just painted one of our units and they told us to change the paint. <laughs> I went, wait a minute, we just finished. And they said, we don't like your paint. Well, so I don't like you. And then we went to war again. You know? Well, a lot and of those people. They called their attorneys and I called them my attorneys. It was horrible. That was people with too much time on their hand. Yeah, and ah, oh, that's what HOA stands for. People with too much time on their hands and nothing to do with cause problems. And they all think they're professional investors. They're horrible. <laughs> you have no issue with homeowners associations. Jesus. And the next category I'm moving up, the worst list is manufactured homes. Deals on wheels. So Kim and I attended workshops on deals on wheels taught by this famous guy. <laughs> he is really funny. But he said the first thing you do is you have this vacant lot and you invite people to move their homes, their mobile homes, onto the lot. And the first thing you do is you, you buy them a tree. And so you, you give them this tree and you ask them to plant it. And they plant it naturally in front of the mobile home so the home is no longer mobile. I said, Jesus. <laughs> they don't want to leave their tree. <laughs> well, they can't get the house out of the, they have to cut the tree down. Yep. <laughs> and I'm going, God, what is this guy is a genius, man. I, I mean, I can't believe it, you know. So that was deals on the wheels. And moving up the list, master plan communities. You know what's lovely about master plan communities? They look good. They're easy to rent to. People love them and all this, but they are kind of a master plan communities and they too have that dreaded HOA, homeowners associations, which I just despise. <laughs> Next up the list is the single family. The good thing about a single family, you're not part of an HOA. But it's single family, moderate and workforce. Yeah, and that's where we started. That's where, yeah, that's where we started. That's where most of our apartment buildings are moderate to workforce. Workforce, you know, not high end, not, not glitzy, you know, basically, um, as Kenny, would, Kenny McElroy would say, next stop is a street. <laughs> and if they don't pay their rent, they got no place else to go, unfortunately. So we take good care of them, but they take good care of us. They and it's a good point, too, with the moderate workforce because you got to, if you're going to be renting apartments or single family homes, you want to make sure there's jobs and people have a lot of jobs yeah. where that's, that's the main criteria. So that makes a lot of sense. And if the market does turn, moderate to workforce is not. I mean, people may downsize to that. Right. So there, you always have a you have, always have a market for workforce. It's it's yep. just above the street, yep. as Kenny would say. You know, they got no place else to go, and they're very happy to have a home and all this. And they generally, have, I, I would say, sixty percent are great tenants. Forty percent, you got to watch like a got to put a guard dog around them. But anyway, they're good people. And number one. Number one, the one we're talking about today is what Kim. Senior housing. And it's what we're talking about today. It's number one. It's so far ahead. It's in the excellent category, and everything else is fair to abysmal. <laughs> and our guest today has been a friend for years. It's Victor Menashe. He is a serial entrepreneur. He started off in Silicon Valley as a smart guy, and then he found religion in real estate. And so Victor is going to be talking to us today about the joys and beauty of assisted living for old guys like me. And uh, Victor is the author of Magnetic Capital, How to Raise All the Money You Need for Any Worthy Venture. It came out in 2017. And Victor is Canadian, and he's also the author of The Great Canadian Takeover, How Savvy Canadians Are Profiting from Stupid Americans. No, 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 that's what everybody says here. <laughs> it says How Savvy Canadians Are Profiting from Stupid Japanese. No, 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 from highly, the wildly, the wildly, They're profiting, profiting wildly, wildly. <laughs> from the meltdown in U.S. real estate. Well, that sounds good there. Anyway, Victor, thanks for all the years of friendship and your credibility. I mean, he's Victor and I have been on the real estate guys' cruises forever. They're fantastic for anyone dedicated to your education, especially in real estate. And Victor is one of the speakers there. They have a lot of great speakers, real authorities on the subject of real estate. And the reason Victor's on this program is because Kim and I just entered the senior or assisted care, old guys, baby boom generation housing. So uh, we just started this mar market. So we're here to learn from Victor just as the rest of you are. So welcome. Welcome, to welcome Victor. Great to be here. So where are, you, where are you located right now, Victor? So right now I'm in northern France, just a few miles away from the Normandy coast. And... Uh, as we're recording this, we're about to celebrate the 75th anniversary of D-Day. Wow. Oh, great. What a place to be. Yep. 
And we have a friend, Joe, who's flying his C-47 or DC-3 over the channel right now yep. to be part of the great invasion. So anyway. So Victor, why is senior housing such a hot property right now and in the future? Well, it's no, it's no secret that the baby boomers are coming and coming in droves. But I will tell you that the marketplace right at this moment in many major markets, many primary markets, is actually overbuilt. And as you know, real estate is hyper-local. So because that's a little bit inefficient, there's a lot of secondary and tertiary markets, a lot of suburban markets that are underserviced, that have been ignored by the major REITs, by the major national players. And frankly, that's where the opportunity lies. When you say overbuilt, overbuilt of senior housing or overbuilt of other real estate properties? Well, the senior housing breaks down into several different asset classes. You know, at the most extreme end of, uh, of care, you're, you're dealing with skilled nursing. And that's what we traditionally think of when we talk about senior care. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, we have independent living or a new category that's called concierge apartments, where these are a little bit more like a condo quality product but they offer a little bit more services, a little bit more amenities. They don't really get into assisted living, allow people to tap into the equity that they may have had in real estate, and instead of buying a condo, they simply pay rent. And a lot of these folks will will get into that space and simply, you know, often sign a five or ten year lease. And they uh, are there any medical or skilled skilled professional services attached? Generally not, not not with uh, concierge apartments. But then in the middle, and this is the area that's the fastest growing, is what we call assisted living. And this is where you don't need quite so much help that you need to be in skilled nursing. And you're not ready, you're not quite um, healthy enough to be on your own in independent living or in a concierge apartment. So let me tell you, what services does that level need? What specific uh, professions? Like, do you need a... You need a cook, do you need nurses, do you need orderlies, do you need bedpan movers? What do you need? Correct. So in assisted living, we typically will have one skilled nurse, uh, one registered nurse on staff. There will be a number of personal attendants, uh, folks who provide uh, you know, the day-to-day care, but you don't necessarily need the full complement of services that you would need in skilled nursing. So there will be an administrator, there will be... Um, There'll be uh, the personal support workers. There will be the kitchen staff. And depending on the type of product that we're talking about, when we speak of assisted living, most of the time people think about the big box facilities. You know, these are the ones that have, you know, 200, 250 beds, some of them even larger. And they tend to have a little bit of an institutional feel. That's what the major national players are playing in. They're, they're building those types of products. But, but, but We, on the other hand, yeah, go ahead. No, but that's you – know, Kim and I have had a lot of friends who were in between there, and they would buy a house in a suburb, and they might put five tenants in that house, and they'd have a nurse and stuff. That's that's the smaller end, right? That's the private end? Correct. So Yeah, so that's the what we call the residential assisted living model, and we're big proponents of that because you get a better ratio of caregivers uh, to residents. And at the end of the day, you know, people will – show up at a big box facility and they'll be lured in by the underwater treadmills and the pottery classes and all of that kind of stuff. But that's not why people are there. They're there because they really can't take care of themselves anymore. They really need the help. And so it's really the quality of care that's the most important. And you really need a better ratio of caregivers to residents. So you don't, you don't need all the flashy stuff. No, in our experience, you know, for example, my partner, Lo, who, who runs our facilities in Dallas, uh, most of the residents who come are coming from one of the big box facilities because they hated it. Oh, that's they, interesting. They lived all their life in, you know, they lived all their life in a single family home. And now they end up in a hospital with a better paint job. Right. And that's about where they are. Right. So let me ask you this, Victor, because baby boomers, you all know baby boomers, they don't want to be called seniors. They don't want to, they, they have this, this. Uh, way about them. They want to be independent. So there was a new product that I've seen in several places where they, it's apartments, just like you said, they sign a lease and they have apartments and it, and they keep that same apartment, whether they're independent. And then if they need more care, they stay in the same apartment and then they have the assisted living come to them. And as they need more care, that more care comes to them, but it gives them more freedom. Are you familiar with that? 
Yeah, we're starting to see that again in some of the larger complexes. Uh, often what they will do is they will have, for example, one floor that's independent living, and, and if they really need more care, then they might be moved to another floor. And in other cases, they've done exactly like you've described. They've decided to move the staff around. When when you start to move the staff around, it gets more challenging because, you know, at the end of the day, uh, assisted living is really first and foremost a service business. You know, we try and make it look like a real estate business for tax purposes, but it's first and foremost a service business with a maybe 20, 25 percent real estate component. So for the look, we had that friend Kathy, you know, from Australia, yes. and she was buying all these right after the crash here in Phoenix when the when single family homes were dirt cheap. She was buying them up and putting four or five beds per unit in these houses, and she had one big problem. She was a horrible manager, and people were dying of starvation and all those other things. <laughs> Which I think is well, funny. she was a real estate person. She was not an assisted living person. Yeah, she that could. was the difference. Yeah. So she looked at it, just like you're saying, Victor, she looked at it as a real estate play versus a service business. So for a lot of our listeners right now, right. you know, probably a single family home that's converted to assisted living. Well, let's address them because you know, Kim and I, how many units are we building right now? Four. In assisted living. It's, it's going to be about 240. Yeah, so that's, we're in that category now. And I'm, I'm, I'm reserving the penthouse in there. <laughs> but anyway... <laughs> So, Victor, what advice? We'll come back. We're, we're kind of out of town, but got, what advice would you have for people like Kim and I when we first started out with very little? How to get into this business? What are the pitfalls, and where are the profits? So, when we come back. We'll be talking more to Victor Manash. Again, he's the author of Magnetic Capital. He's a longtime friend, a great guy. I mean, I can speak very highly of him. Very competent, smart guy from Silicon Valley who found redemption in real estate. So Victor is, a, is the author of Magnetic Capital, How to Raise All the Money You Need for Any Worthwhile Venture, and that's what Victor did in Silicon Valley for our, these uh, tech companies. So we come back, we'll find out what is and how it is you, even if it's a small time like him and I were at one time, how do you get started in the best real estate venture projects today? We'll be right back. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about real estate. You can listen to the Rich Dad Radio program anytime, anywhere on iTunes or Android. And all of our programs are archived at richdadradio.com because one of the best ways to learn is by repetition. So if you want to learn more about this subject today, which is assisted living, the best real estate play in the markets today all over the world, the best because baby boomers are getting old. And so there's the best real estate play of all. You can go to listen to this program at richdadradio.com. Our guest today is Victor Menashe. He's a serial entrepreneur He's from Silicon Valley. And uh, he found redemption in real estate. He's the author of Magnetic Capital, How to Raise All the Money You Need for Any Worthy Venture. And his website is victorjm.com. And I want to say this, Victor is very generous with his information, education, and all that. He holds classes. He's very supportive of the Rich Dad program. So if you want to find out more about Victor's classes on this important subject, this one division of real estate called Senior Assisted Living, it's victorjm.com. Any comments, Kim? Well, you know, we're going to get into a little bit about demographics, but you talk about the demand for this product for assisted living. Um, you talk about that there's a number of Americans 65 and older are going to hit 79.2 million by 2035. That's only 15 years away. But they're already, well, already they're that. already here. They're already here. And right now they say and this was true of of the the project we're working on Robert is that the typical age of a, a housing re, an assisted housing resident is 83 years and right now there's like 10 million of them. So numbers are increasing. The numbers are increasing. That's if, what makes a good trend. Yeah. And our, our new saying is, you know how Kenny always said, because we're in workforce housing, next stop is the street. Our saying in assisted living is, this is your last bed. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and our guest today is Victor Menashe. And Victor. Well, I, was, my, I was speaking of my, my last bet also. You know, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm of that age category. <laughs> Victor's a serial entrepreneur and real estate investor. He spent 25 years in the tech industry, Silicon Valley and elsewhere. And then he discovered that what he wanted to do was real estate. And he's now quite the expert when it comes to assisted living and senior housing. So welcome back, Victor. Great to be here. So for the, the, the new guy, a new couple starting out in this real estate venture, and let's say they have, they're going to buy a three-bedroom, two-bath house in a solid neighborhood, what are the opportunities, what are the pitfalls, and what are the things you need to watch out for? One of the biggest rookie mistakes I see in this particular space is people trying to actually start too small. There are a number, of course, Assisted living is one of these businesses that's regulated at the state level. So there's an awful lot of regulation that you've got to adhere to. Some states limit you to very, very small houses, four or five, six beds. And frankly, it's difficult at that size to make the numbers work. It really is difficult. The overheads end up being too high. But if you can get a facility where you can put 10, 12, or 15 beds, now you're talking. Now you can start to get the numbers to work. You still do need some economies of scale. Yes, the numbers are great. You can get anywhere from five to twelve thousand dollars per bed per month, depending on where you're where you are in the country, uh, and those numbers are fantastic. But of course, most of that goes to pay for the services. So you've got to have the economies. You've got to make that work. Otherwise, you end up being an owner operator, and just like you know, you don't want to buy a job. You want to buy an investment. So let's so let's let's get the numbers simple. Let's say it's fifteen thousand dollars a month per bed. Where does it? What where are the, what are the let's, expenses? Let's go, let's go with six. Let's go with six thousand. Let's go with six thousand. That's more realistic. Okay, okay let's go with ten because I can't count below. <laughs> so let's go ten because okay. the numbers are easier. Okay. Sure. What are the What are the expenses per bed? So the, the number one expense it by far is the staffing. And as a as an operator of assisted living, your top three issues are staffing, staffing, and staffing. What, uh, what? Finding the right people, finding the right quality of people, uh, that that's really the most important thing. So what kind of staff do you need? That's a, what, what professional staff? So you will need a you'll need an administrator. Of course this depends on the state, so the, every state is a little bit different, but you'll need an administrator, you'll need a um, you'll need a driver, someone who can take people places. You will need someone who can cook. You will need uh, a registered nurse, and you will need uh, personal support workers. So if you have too small a facility, you end up having too much overhead. If you get up around, like I said, 15, 16 people, the numbers actually start to make sense. Can you put 15 or 16 people in a three-bedroom house? No, not at all. So that's... Sometimes what you end up doing... Yeah. So that's where our friend Kathy went bust house. because she was she had too right. small a house and too high overhead. So what would be the ideal house for 15, 15 uh, people, 15 well, residents? these days we actually, we purpose build them. Uh, we purpose build a 16-bedroom house. Uh, we've got really? a design that we're building in North Dallas. Uh, we've got some that we're building in Louisiana. And if you think about it like the letter H where you've got four quadrants with four bedrooms in each quadrant, and a common area in the center where you've got your kitchen, your living room area, uh, where people congregate, where they can watch TV, where they can play cards, all of that sort of thing that's happening in the common area. And each of those four wings are somewhat segregated, a little bit more private, a little bit quieter, and uh, we, that's how we design our, our homes so uh, around that concept. is it easier to find an existing house or to build a new house? It's uh, it's easier to, in some ways, it's easier to build a new one if you can get the entitlements. And what we partic- in particular like to do is build a campus of 16-bedroom homes. The reason for that is because residents like to be in that home-like setting. They'd rather have it be like Thanksgiving dinner every night, where there's you know a dozen friends at dinner, as opposed to a ca- eating cafeteria style where the food's coming out on a steamer tray. It's a different experience. So when you say a campus, could you have like four or five? Could you have four or five of these H models, these housing models? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, we're building one right now uh, with five with uh, room to expand to eight. So that'll be a total of 128 beds uh, in on one single property. 
So, but, but it still creates that that small feel. So what you're basically saying is, if you're small, don't start. If you're too small. Well, you can definitely start. No, yeah, you don't want to go too small. If you, I really believe that you know, twelve to sixteen beds is really the minimum threshold to make it economically viable. Otherwise, it's really, really hard to make the numbers work. It's hard to hire the staff. And and is it you? You got individual rooms. Does does shared rooms work? Some people do shared rooms. We're not a fan of that. We prefer individual rooms. People like their privacy. They like, uh, you know, they have their own habits. You know, if, if in the big box facilities, if uh, if they're doing the rounds at 7 a.m., that's the time you're getting up. But in the residential model, if someone wants to sleep in until 9 or 10 in the morning, they should have the ability to do that. They've earned it. Why not? Let's, you know, let's remember who the client is. So what and, about... And what build the, the service to the client. So what about toilets? Does each room have to have a toilet and bath? Uh, we that we build that into every we build a bathroom with every room. Now, and a not bath. All facilities do that. Some have shared bathrooms. Yeah. Uh, well, typically uh, uh, um, uh, accessible showers. So you could literally roll into the shower with a walker or a wheelchair um, and uh, do your bathing in uh, in an accessible type of environment. One last question: Is the staff twenty four seven? They are, and we, we typically reduce the nighttime staff, so we might go a ratio of, say, 5 to 1 during the day, and we might go 10 or 15 to 1 at night, but, but typically we'll, we'll have staff 24-7, uh, yes. And, and let's talk about this, Victor. So, of course, these are aging people, and there is going to be turnover in death. That's, like, that's why I said <laughs> that, this, that is, seems this, like is, a, this is your last bed. Yeah, you know? that seems like it could be a, a, a negative to the, all of this. How do you how do you deal with that? Well, it's obviously very difficult. Uh, one of the things that is a growing trend that um, is we're really quite thankful for is the idea of mobile hospice uh, for folks mm-hmm. that are in their final days. Uh, to have to move at that point is very very disruptive you can have the hospice care come to you that's that's extremely beneficial what what is hospice and, uh, a lot of jurisdictions are studying yeah what is hospice so hospice is that's the what's often called the palliative care this is where they don't focus on trying to keep you alive but they try to keep you comfortable so if you have a do not resuscitate order or something like that where you, you know your terminal and so the focus is on simply making you comfortable jeez doesn't sound like a fun business. <laughs> Not that part of it. No. Not that part of it. No. So so you talk about um, some of the pitfalls being starting too small, making sure you have the right staff. What other pitfalls go along with this product? You know, pr- probably the other pitfall is going in a market that is really, really saturated. You know, I'm thinking of markets right now like San Antonio where the occupancy market-wide is winning in the 70s. So if you're coming in with a new facility, you'll have a hard time getting the occupancy to where you need it to be because there's a little bit of saturation in that market. When you say and 70s, huge believer. Wait, when you say 70s, yeah. 70 percent occupied. Yes, that's correct. And 30 percent number. That's so like you only have 30 percent va- vacant. Yeah. Only 30 percent vacant. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, that's, it's hard to make the numbers work when you've got that much product in the market. And what markets are you finding that are that are great opportunities for assisted living? Again, it's those secondary markets, some tertiary markets where you know there is uh, there's demand, but there isn't the supply. It's been neglected by a lot of the national players, and a lot of suburban markets. Some of the affluent suburban markets have also been neglected. Like any business, you've got to do your homework. You've got to do your market studies and see what the supply-demand situation is. You don't want to go necessarily into a market that's oversupplied. So how would somebody find out that information? Uh, you can, there are, there are market studies, there are, there are analysts out there that you can hire for not too much money that can, uh, that can get you that data. There's the senior housing newsletter that if you're really interested in becoming part of that business, you can literally get an email every day with industry data. Hmm. And uh, really just get out and talk to people. Talk to people in the market and find out what they're experiencing. So that's two. That's two more than you would expect them to. Yeah, there's two, there's two businesses. You know, there's the actual business of the senior care, 
And then, as you said, there's the real estate side. And Kim and I like the real yeah. estate side, and we are building an assisted living facility, 240 beds, let's say, but we want nothing to do with the business, right, Kim? That's right. So what are the what are the pros and cons of each business? First is the senior care side, and then the real estate side, because that's how you got to look at it, right? It, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So what a lot of people do is they will actually separate the business into two, into a real estate business and into an operations business. Uh, you literally charge rent to the operator and, uh, and you separate the real estate into a separate entity. That means you can take the depreciation through that real estate entity. And you know, depending on, on how you structure things, you might be able to take more than your fair share simply by charging higher rent. So Again, you're... the advantage would be that you... Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. So your renter is actually your operator. Exactly, the renter is the operator. That's exactly right. Do you and but some people are both, right? The investor and the operator. Many people combine the two, and sometimes they will still, even in that situation, they will separate them into separate entities, so that you can siphon off more of the earnings into the real estate and take advantage of the depreciation. I mean, that's exactly that's end. exactly the formula we're using right now. Is we've got the developer who's building it, and then he's partnered up with an operator who's very successful at assisted living. Um, and, and Kim and I are the landlords. Operations. Yeah, we own we own the land. Yeah. So let me ask you this, Victor. I, this has to be a, a, an important part on the on the the money side. Is how do you market your homes? It's a great question. The, the key to marketing the homes is actually to relationship build in the marketplace. It's a fairly organic process. Um, oftentimes, you're going to get referrals from people. You're going to market a little bit of digital marketing, but oftentimes it's, it's local marketing, just like you would for apartments. What you will find is that once you become known in the marketplace, someone moves into one of the big box facilities, they hate it, and all of a sudden the kids are looking around to find some alternatives. And, uh, and at that point, you're solving someone's problem. You're solving someone's acute need because mom or dad are in a place that they really hate. And, and what, we, what we were told is our 5.6 acres is on Camelback and it's probably the prime location left in, Arizona, in Phoenix right now. But what this guy said to me is because the neighborhood the is affluent. The demographics, yes. I mean, the kids are affluent. They'll want mom and dad close by in this facility. Does that logically fit your model? Oh, absolutely. That's that's exactly right. When you do the demographic studies to figure out where to build a facility, you not only look at where the parents are living, you look where the kids are living because they're ultimately the ones who are going to be coming to visit mom or dad. They're often going to be paying the bill or subsidizing part of that cost. So uh, the location of the kids is absolutely critical. So that brings up a, a kind of a socioeconomic question. What happens to poor people living in poor neighborhoods and they got parents who are in that facility, in that condition? What are poor people doing when assisted living is so expensive? And sometimes assisted living is more expensive than living. That's a huge issue, and there are different models. There's the private pay model, uh, which is what, where we're focused, and I expect that's where your facility is going to be focused. There's those that are subsidized, and they're certainly not that. Uh, they're not priced nearly that high. Many of them are going to be around 2500 2800 a month. Again, most of that goes to pay for staff or services, but they're not offering the level of service, the level, level of care, the level of staff. That uh, that a private pay assisted living facility would be able to offer. And then, what about the? Uh, you know, we have a friend who's paying like um, sixteen thousand a month, and he's got the best of the best, and or so he thinks. And yet, he was not happy with the service. So, I mean, and he, that's, and he didn't have a lot of other options. Yeah, so he he's willing to pay more, but he he says it was not available. This is in Hawaii. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, that could that could very well be. I, I know I'm familiar with several in the New York area that uh, treat very affluent uh, clientele, and uh, they're typically up around ten, twelve thousand a month. Uh, they also require usually uh, an equity down payment, believe it or not. 
uh, and then you get that back, and at least your, your estate will get that back. But, um, you know, those those facilities can, can be very good. I've seen some very, very nice ones, in particular in the New York area. Wow, what a business this is, you know, I mean. <laughs> okay, so one it. last question, because this is my, so let's say somebody is, let's say, in the working class, and they're making probably 50000 a year, and mom and dad are going to require, let's say, 5000 a month, and they don't have it because they got kids and kids are going to college and all that. What happens to that person, that couple, that family with those parents? And let's say they have two sets of parents. What, what? Well, the choices are pretty are, – yeah, the choices are limited because if your parents need round-the-clock care, either the family's going to try and provide it on their own until they – you know, until they burn out, or if you hire round-the-clock care, that's extraordinarily expensive. You know, you're talking about three shifts. Uh, you're typically looking at about 125, 130 thousand a year to bring care directly into your home. So, compared against that alternative, assisted living is a bargain. Generally speaking, people stay in assisted living on average about three years. They're not there for a decade. We're talking about three years, so you're talking about making an investment of, you know, fifty, sixty thousand dollars over a three-year period uh, to help mom and dad in their final years. So, so a lot of a lot of what called the lower lower middle income, they got kids are going to college, and mom and dad will need yep. dormitories also. It's 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 a squeeze. There there are they screwed? I mean, are, are there? It's a squeeze. Yeah, yeah. The alternative for them is, is to go with some of the subsidized models, the, the ones where there's Medicare, a Medicare component to it. And they exist, but they're in high demand and short supply. And uh, it's, you know, there isn't enough to go around in that category. Yeah, it's, just, for sure. it's just like your, your product, you have a certain demographic who's going to be your customer. You're, so not, you're exactly, not all things to exactly. all people is what I'm okay. saying. You're not all things to all people. You have a certain demographic that is your, your target market. That's exactly right. I mean, it's like comparing Motel 6 with uh, the Fairmont Hotel. Yes. They're not the same product. So the last thing is this, Victor, um, I, without asking you, you offer, do you offer seminars on this? Um, so um, my partner, uh, Lil Hornbuckle does, absolutely, uh, and uh, the Residential Assistant Living Academy, Jean Galina, who you know very well, right. uh, also does. Uh, and, in fact, uh, Jean is based in Phoenix, a lot of the the, the workshops that he holds are based there. Uh, and if you want to find out more about that, uh, go to the Residential Assisted Living Academy. Residential yeah. Assisted Living Academy dot com. Correct. Correct. So, uh, Victor, again, thank, thank you, Victor. Thank you very much for all your information. Glad information. And we really appreciate it. Um, Thanks for your compassion and my insensitivity. <laughs> but, <laughs> you're, 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 you're doing a great service for not just, I mean, for the, for, your, for the tenants as well as the investors. So I think it's a great matchup. Yeah, and Kim knows in about 10 years I got the penthouse in our place, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so I'm building my future home. That's what I'm doing right now. <laughs> so again, Victor Menashe, thank you very much. His website is victorjm.com. His author of Magnetic Capital how to raise all the money you need for any worthy venture. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, Victor. Thanks. Thanks for talking to you both. All right. Take care. And we'll come back with the most popular part of our program, which is Ask Robert. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. Once again, thank you to Victor Manash. He's the author of Magnetic Capital, How to Raise All the Money You Need for Any Worthy Venture. And this man, man knows what he's talking about. Today, our discussion was senior assistant living, the best investment in real estate, but you better know what you're doing. And Victor's website is victorjm.com. And so um, I want to talk about my little raven here, and my latest book out here is called Fake. And the reason this is here is because I'll be working on another book now with one of my heroes, Jim Rickards, author of The Currency, Currency Wars and The Road to Ruin, and I'm very excited about it. But we're all talking about the same subject, which is fake. And Jim and I are, come from different points of view, but you better really know what you're talking about today and listen to people who know what they're talking about. So that's my long way of saying, Victor knows what he's talking about. And that's, that's why I thank him for being part of this program, especially if you're going to assisted living, because the numbers look good, 
but so are the expenses. Any comments, Kim? Well, one of the biggest takeaways I got is that if you're going to go into assisted living, there is the real estate play, and then there's the operator play. Yeah. So if you're going to go into assisted living, you better be sure you have a good operator who understands the assisted living business while you do the real estate business. Right. If you read, if, if you read fake in there, I talk about the McDonald's model. What business is McDonald's in? They're in real estate. But you better know the hamburger business before you go into that. And it, to me, I just personally, I get sick and tired of talking to people who think real estate's about making money. You know, you really, it's a business. And it's a very profitable business for the right people. But 90% of the people are idiots. They don't know what to do. And you know, and Kim and I have had partners say, yeah, yeah, I know real estate, I bought six houses. For what? To live in. Well, buying a house to live in is not the real estate business. And so that's why the, the biggest thing in fake here is fake teachers, fake assets, fake money. And many people are listening to fake teachers. Not only are school teachers, but they're financial planners or financial advisors, they're stock brokers or real estate brokers. And it, it just, I get tired of it. I mean, as Kim knows, I'm probably not long for this business because I sit there and I say the same thing. You know, take a class, get educated. It's your money. Oh no, just tell me what to do. And I get sick and tired of it. So that's why, you know, I'd rather go and talk to guys like Rickards and we're talking about the Ravens as how to predict the future. Well, it's not easy, it's not that hard to predict the future. If somebody is really stupid, they're gonna be broke, period. I don't care what business you're in, real estate, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, commodities, and most people just wanna sit there and be told what to do. I can't believe it. I mean, I just really can't believe it. I mean, I hated school, but I like learning. So I, I, met, I met Victor on the Real Estate Guys Summit at Sea Cruises. You guys wanna learn real estate, the real estate guys are some of the best teachers I know. They have the, they don't, they're not the teachers, they bring in great teachers. Like Kenny McElroy teaches for them, Victor teaches for them, Gene teaches for them. And really it is time, if you're gonna get smart, you'd better understand what a real teacher is and a fake teacher. So that's why I'm, I'm happy to be working with my friend Rickards on The Raven. The Raven is how do you see the future? And one of the ways to see the future is get smarter, or you can just, you're gonna just keep losing and, money. And one comment to that is, you know, people, they work all day, every day for money. I mean, they spend their whole life, they give their whole life to work for money, yet they don't take any time to study money or to study how to grow their money or to study what to do with their money, yet they spend their entire life working for it. No, and, and think about fake assets. They give their money to Wall Street. Stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs, and savings. That's, those aren't assets, they're liabilities to you. Well, well, well I was told to do that. I was well, told that's to save problem. money and put money in the stock market. But that's yeah. all, that's Invest as for far the long as term. education goes. So that's, that's my frustration, you know, after years and years and years of doing, being in teaching, people still ask the same stupid question. What should I do with my money? Is it real estate? Should I get in stocks? Well, why don't you take a stupid class? and learn something. That's why that's why my message for today. First question, Melissa. Our first question today, Kim, comes from Rakim in Houston, Texas. Favorite book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. It says, Robert, I am 24 years old and I recently started my journey to investing in real estate and I'm also working to bring a product to market to help me get out of the rat race. With the possibility of a crash coming in the near future, is there any advice you would give a young entrepreneur that is just starting out and hasn't been through a crash before? Yeah, the same answer. Take a real estate course, take a business course, take classes, just don't go back to school because you don't learn any of this stuff at school. Or buy my book, Fake, Fake Money, Fake Teachers, Fake Assets. Look, your most, most valuable asset is your brain. It's also your biggest liability. So when I write fake money, fake teachers, fake assets, the chances are you've been listening to some really stupid teachers, poor teachers, like my poor dad. They're good people, but they're poor. And if you don't make the decision, which I cover in fake, choose your teachers wisely. So that's the story of rich dad, poor dad, is I couldn't listen to my dad. I love him dearly, smart man, good man, and all that, but the guy knew nothing about money. Why would I listen to him? That's what I have to say. You better start searching good teachers because the moment you start going into business and real estate, your product means jack. You know, everybody's got a great product, but they don't have a good business. Everybody can make a hamburger better than McDonald's, but they couldn't build a McDonald's. 
So if you understand that, then you start asking yourself questions. Well, what do I, what don't I know? To jump into business and real estate is suicide, right, Kim? Yeah, it is. Well, it can be. And my question to Rakim is, you're when you're getting into a journey on real estate and, and you're launching a product. Do, which which are you going to do? Because you're going to split your energies between the two. I would like, hey, focus on one. Like Robert and I, we or built take a classes. business and take class. Well, that's that's part of you got to focus on one. You got to get educated. You got to take classes. But for you and I, we took a lot of classes. We started a business, and once the business is up and running, then the cash flow from that bought our real estate. So. But we also hang- decide what you're going to do. Is, is my question. What are you I also do? hang out with guys like Vector, and go on these cruises, and I learn. I'm I just came off the real estate guys cruise. Guess Kenny, we, we have we have you know fortune fortune builders. They teach real estate classes. But you better start finding real teachers. If there's nothing I leave you with today, don't think you're a genius because you don't know all the answers. Like our friend who was buying assisted living homes. She only had five people in it. She worked really hard and she went bust, but she was an assistant living in real estate. But would she take a class? No. And she deserved to go bankrupt. She deserved it. That's God's punishment for ignorance. So if you understand that, then when people ask me, what's the mo- I got 10,000, what should I do with it? Take classes from real teachers, not fake teachers. And don't buy fake assets. If you really don't want to learn about money, business, real estate, business, invest for the long term in the stock market because that's what idiots do because they're fake assets and you'll deserve whatever you get. So when it comes to the question of crashes, the last, last answer to this, crashes are the best time to get rich, but they're also the best time to go poor. And those without any financial education listen to fake teachers, millions will go poor. Final comments, Kim. I think you're good. So that's what I have to say. I mean, it frustrates me. I mean, how many times have I have this Rich Dad Radio program? People, well, just tell me what to do. Well, if you want to be told what to do, financial, find a financial planner or go back to school and get a high-paying job, get deeply into student one. loan debt. <laughs> I mean, give me a break, you guys, here. So that's why we have Rich Dad Radio. So I'm glad you asked the question, but the answer for me is all the, always the same. Fine, get educated. Learn from real people, not fake teachers. Most financial advisors, stockbrokers, and real estate brokers are salespeople. They're not rich people. So with that, thank you for the questions. You can submit your questions to Ask Robert at Rich Dad Radio. Thank you to Victor Bentmanash. Please go to his website and learn more about assisted living before you jump in. Thank you for listening.